All right, so today's chapters are chapters 30 to 32. Um, quick recap on chapter 27 to 29. Piper finds out about Natalie talking to an inmate, which we find out the inmate is called Onion because of the grease in his hair. Um, Piper won't leave it alone, and she really wants um, Natalie to go back and meet this inmate, so that way she can find out a way to meet other inmates. All right, so chapters 30 to 32. Chapter 30, I. Tuesday, May 7th, and Wednesday, May 8th, 1935. All I think about is telling my mom about 105. She'll say ugly things, but then it will be done. I'll never be given this kind of responsibility again. I'll go back to being a kid, the way I was before moving to the stupid turd-covered rock. Natalie will be safe, and we can all move somewhere else. I would do this in a flash if it weren't for my father. I can't stand to disappoint him again. I try to forget all of this, try to stop the churning in my mind, but as soon as I do, Natalie mutters 105, and I'm back into it again. She's always had a number of the week, as my father calls it. It's usually the number of buttons in her collection, or shoes in my mother's closet, or spools of thread in the drawer. Ever, every day, or ever since the day I lost her, the number has been 105. 105, she says almost every day now, her hand on the doorknob and the hard force of her whole self self-headed out but somehow i keep her inside i let her play with her buttons and feed her four pieces of lemon cake while she sits by the door on tuesday when my mother comes home she seems to know we've stayed inside again of course i've managed to separate natalie from her buttons before my mom walks up the stairs from the dock even so my mother knows and when natalie refuses to eat one bite of supper so stuffed is she with lemon cake my father knows too I hover around my father. When he says he has to help the warden with a project after supper, I offer to go with him, beg him, actually. I don't want to be left alone with my mom, but he says he can't take me. There's a problem in the cell house kitchen where I'm not allowed to go. Moose, my mom says as soon as my father is gone. I have a lot of homework, I say. My mother nods. I can't bear this. It's in my head and the sentences I plan to tell her the truth. I let my sister hold hands with a convict. They were all. They were alone together twice, three times. I don't even know how many. I was over there looking six, seven times. I wish I could make my mother understand how much more complicated this is than she thinks. But the only way to do this is to tell her what happened, which I can't seem to do. My mother doesn't yell about us staying inside. Not one critical word comes out of her mouth. She doesn't have to say anything. The air itself carries her blame. I feel it when I breathe. We both keep our space, never passing close to one another, like magnets set to repel. The next day, when the door closes behind my mother, Natalie says she, what she'd be, said all day long the day before, 105. No, Natalie, not today. Today we're doing buttons, I say. But the buttons aren't in the bureau drawer. They aren't on top of the icebox or in the cupboard by the stove. They aren't in my mom's closet on the, or the bread box either. I turn the place upside down, searching every drawer twice. But I know I won't find them because they aren't there. My mother has taken them with her. I didn't see her do this, but I know she has. The only thing I can do is keep Natalie inside. I look for cake. One slim piece of lemon is all I find. Half a piece, really. Natalie looks up at me. She has washed my feet as I've watched or as, as I've looked for her buttons. I can't tell if she knows exactly what's going on, but she knows something. Fine, I say, pulling open a drawer for the third time now. Fine, we'll... I let the sentence drift off. Then I march to my room and get my math books and stack them by the door. We'll read math books all afternoon. I'll stand in front of the door. I won't let her pass. I'm stronger. I have 40, maybe 50 pounds on her. Natalie is rocking wildly like a little boat in a ship's wake. 105, she says. No, I say. Buttons, she says. Numbers, I say, cracking open a book and offering it to her. Look, Natalie, you can read about numbers. Buttons 105. She's rocking crazy hard. Why not just let her throw a fit? Why try so hard? Outside. Buttons 105. She's spinning now. I try to ignore her. I open my book, but I read the same sentence over and over. The meaning won't go into my head. Stop it, Natalie, I yell. But she's losing herself. The scream has started. It begins low like a piece of machinery that needs time to warm up. Stop it, Natalie. I holler loud in her face. Stop being like this. Don't you see what you're doing? You're not a little kid. Stop acting like one. She throws herself on the floor. She kicks the coffee table. Do you have any idea what you're doing to us, to mom and dad? You're making them old. 
They worry about you all the time. At least you can try. At least you can do that. Sometimes I think you don't even try, and I hate you for it, Natalie. We try so hard and you don't. I hate you, Natalie. I do. A vase hits the rug. It thumps hard but doesn't break. She's near the window now, twisting, banging feet, hands flailing on the floor. The more I yell, the more she screams, like we're trying to top each other. My shouts are full of words. Hers are only sounds, animal sounds, piercing and terrified. There's banging outside. I see through the window Mrs. Trixel's brand new red hair and short round Mrs. Cacone trying to see what's happening. I'm surprised she made it up the stairs so fast. Someone else is banging too. Moose, it's me, Teresa. Let me in. Open up, Moose. What's going on in there? B. Trixel calls. I can help. You need me, Teresa again. Teresa, go back inside, B. Trixel tri cries. Stop it. Stop it. I have my hands on Nat's arms. I want to shake her. Shake her hard. My arms tremble with the effort not to. Natalie screams louder. I look into those trapped eyes. Wherever she is, she can't get out, which only makes her scream louder. And suddenly, I'm not angry anymore. Open the door, Moose. We're okay, I call, through, though I know how ridiculous this sounds. Please, Nat, don't do this. I run to the kitchen. How about some lemon cake, I plead. But she's well beyond lemon cake. She takes the cake, mashes it in her hands, and throws the plate against the wall busting it into a, a billion pieces. Her whole body is moving in all directions as if she is as, as if each limb has its own plan. All of a sudden, I remember what my mother used to do. I pick Natalie up, screaming and fighting, her skull bashing against my chin, and set her as gently as I can on her back on one corner of the rug. She's moving so wildly, she kicks me in the shin. Her hand boxes my ear. It's hard to keep her in one place, but I grab hold of her waist and pin her down at one corner. I hold her in the corner of the rug and roll tightly, gently, using my knees to keep her in. When the rug is all the way around her, I wait, and slowly the fight begins to leak out of her. With the tightness surrounding her, she feels safe, secure somehow. She lays shaking, grateful and forlorn. In the stained red carpet, I breathe in a dust, dust rug sweat smell. Mrs. Cacone and Mrs. Trixel are still banging on the door. They have gotten Mrs. Madman now. She's tall enough to see what's happening inside. She's holding baby Rocky. I ignore them and talk to Natalie in a sweet, calm voice as if she were a baby, if she were a baby too. Natalie, how can I help you? Natalie is quiet, breathing hard. She's calm now except for her eyes, which seem to be moving back and forth in her head as if they're still searching for a way out. You're okay now, Natalie. I stroke her tangled hair, my hand brushing against her hot, wet forehead. Moose... Natalie outside, she says. Oh, Natalie, I shake my head. I, Natalie says. What? Something in your eye? Her eyes have slowed down. I look to see if something is in them. I can't see anything. I, yes, I know you were upset. That's why your eyes are moving around that way, I say. I, she says. She's calm now. I unroll the rug. She sits up, both hands on her chest, petting it as if it has a full coat of fur. I, she says again, that's not your eye, Natalie, I say. That's your chest. I outside, Natalie says. You want to look outside? I check to see if B. Trixel and Mrs. Cacone and Mrs. Madman are still there. They're gone. Maybe they realized we were okay and went away. Or maybe they've gone to get a crowbar or my father. I look back at Natalie. Her face is scrunched up. It's crushed as if she wants me to understand, and I won't. I outside, she says loud like I'm deaf. I say nothing. I don't know what she wants. Her face seems to close in with the effort. I want to go outside, she says finally. We're working on pronouns. My mom said this. Pronouns. Natalie, who never called herself anything but Natalie my whole life, just called herself I. Oh, I say. I want to go outside. My voice breaks. I want to go outside, she says, the look of relief on her face, as big as 30 states. I open the door then. I do. How could I not? All right, so that was a huge moment there. Um, Natalie has only talked in third person up until this point in the book, and she's been working with Mrs. Kelly, and then now all of a sudden she has used her first pronoun and called herself I instead of Natalie. Chapter 31, My Dad. Same day, Wednesday, May 8th, 1935. We go to the parade grounds. Natalie gets on the swings. There's a mom there with her four-year-old son. She pushes him. I push Natalie. She's too big and too old for this. Her hips are too large for the seat. I ignore this. I ignore them. She can pump herself, but I know she prefers to have me push. 
After a few minutes, I notice her head is tipping to the side. I run around to the front just in time to catch her as she falls forward. She's sound asleep. Tantrums exhaust her. I can sure see why. They exhaust me too. I carry her home as best I can. She seems so solid, so big, a real grown-up person in my arms. I stop often, leaning her weight on a cement wall, the edge of a building, the banister. I'm almost to the back stairwell when my dad finds us. He doesn't ask what happened. He simply takes Natalie from me, and I follow him to our apartment. We walk through the wild mess of our living room, rug pulled out from the coffee table, vases upended in a puddle of water, broken plate, slivers, and lemon cake scattered everywhere. My foot crunches the china pieces as I follow my father to Natalie's room. He places her gently on her bed and covers her with her favorite purple blanket. Then he goes to the icebox and opens a beer. He looks over at me, see, seems to think a minute, opens another, and pours a full glass for himself and half a glass for me. My father rarely drinks and never with me. I had a few sips once at Pete's house, but I didn't like it much. That doesn't matter. What matters is he seems to understand. In the living room, he sets his beer down, picks up the vase, and puts it back where it belongs. I set my beer by his and get the broom. The room is silent except for the clock ticking on the mantel, the sound of sweeping and the clink of china pieces as my father drops them in the metal trash tin. Dad, I ask, how come you always do what mom tells you? My dad makes a funny sound, a kind of laugh through his nose. He says nothing and then a full minute later, I don't always, most of the time, my father swallows, considers this. Yeah, most of the time I guess I do. How come? I ask, sweeping a glass piece off the rug to the floor and up the incline to the dustpan. My father takes a sip of his beer. Things matter more to your mother than they do to me. What things? Everything. Everything? I ask. I'm watching him now, searching his golden brown eyes. Everything except you. My father bites his lip. The tears well up. He turns away and busies himself, tugging the rug back in place. I strain my eyelids open and try to breathe the tears back in my head. I look down and then take a breath. Dad, I ask. I'm going to tell him what happened now I am. Yeah, he says. Did I cause Natalie to be the way she is? The question seems to come from somewhere deep inside of me. Moose? My father freezes, his eyes riveted on me. Something I did? You said she got worse when she was three. That's when I was born. Was it me? I concentrate on the rug. M Moose. My dad grabs my shoulders and he looks straight into my eyes. I don't know, he says, taking a teary breath. What caused Natalie to be sick? But I didn't. I don't think anyone knows that. But I do know this. He bites his lip, his voice so full of feeling he's having trouble speaking. Absolutely. Absolutely for sure. It had nothing, nothing at all to do with you. Chapter 32, The Button Box. Same day, Wednesday, May 8th, 1935. When my mother comes in, Natalie's button box clattering against the sides of her purse, she sees me with the beer. Her eyes register the shock. What happened? Where's Natalie? She asks, her voice sharp and tight in, in, in her throat. Natalie's fine. She's asleep in her room, my father says, but I need to talk to you. Me? My mom asks, her voice high and childlike. Yes, my father says. My mother's eyes dart to me, then back to my dad. Just you and I, my father says, cocking his head toward the bedroom. I don't want to talk here. My mother nods. She follows my father into the bedroom. At first, it's quiet in there. Hushed voices muffled by the closed door. Then the voices get louder and more angry. My mother cries. My father is angry and firm. I hear my name. I walk closer to the door. Look, my mother says, I'm not taking any chances with this. Mrs. Kelly says, I know what Mrs. Kelly says. I'm talking about Moose now and what he thinks. He's good with Natalie. They've worked out a relationship. We have to respect that and trust him. Well, yes, but you have to let him care about her in this way or care about her his way. And then something I can't hear. I got one child who has everything, my mom says. Big, strapping, healthy, smart, makes people laugh. Got kids coming over looking for him night and day, just like at home. Little ones, big ones, and the girls, they all like Moose. But Natalie, Natalie doesn't have the whole world looking out for her. She needs me. Moose needs you too. Fiddlesticks, Cam. You don't think, she, you don't think he does? She sighs. I suppose he does. You two never try to understand each other, my father says. Little things become big things with you and Moose that quick. He snaps his fingers. Couldn't you have just talked to him about the button box? My mom is quiet for a minute. When she begins talking again, her voice is too low for me to hear. Now both of them are speaking softly. They aren't mad anymore. I think about what my dad said. I think so hard it makes my head ache. 
In Natalie's room, she's she's still sleeping, but I feel better since in here, since in here with her. I feel better sitting in here with her. Sorry. She's so peaceful when she sleeps, so normal. This is the sister I might have had. I see now the person we've missed. Natalie, I whisper, this is your chance. I smooth out her tangled hair. You have to get in the SRP Marion off this time, okay? Mom can't handle it if you don't. All right, that is the end of chapter 32.